Narav and Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome! It is time to continue my discussion on the various forgotten collectible card games of old, where I go over all these releases in the collectible card game world dating back to, of course, Magic the Gathering. Talk about ones that have fallen by the wayside in some way. The company doesn't support them anymore. The player base has shrunk. Whatever reason... They might still have some support from some kind of community, whether producer or actual players, but they just aren't as popular as they ever were, if they are popular at all anymore. So today for you, I am continuing with the collectible card game, On the Edge. We're going to talk about the rules of this game and how you play it, and we're going to dive into that over the next few episodes. So let's start with some of the basics on On the Edge. It's played in either any number of players, or any number of teams, because you can play this one as teams, not just as single players playing in a group. And it really does allow for any number within this group. Now, the fact is, it's a very simplistic idealism that you are for trying to win the game. You're trying to build them up enough influence upon this island, this imaginary island of Alamarja, and that influence represents your control of the island, that you're spreading your influence, gaining control of it, and then when you, you or your team have control of it, you win. Pretty simple. Pretty interesting concept. Now, the amount of influence that you're going to be required to re get depends, of course, upon the number of players slash teams that are participating. There is a chart within the rules, but I will go over the, two lo the lowest and the highest numbers. Lowest for two players you have to get 24 influence. Pretty big chunk. That also could be two teams. Highest is if you get five or more players or teams. At that point, you only need to get 10 influence. Now, it is important to note that when you're normally playing, at the, if you're doing players, if a player starts their turn with whatever influence you need to win the game, you win the game. It's at the start of the turn you take stock of if they have enough influence or not. That's when you have to have it. When it comes to teams, you have to make sure that all the teams basically contribute to influence together and that each member of the team has to meet the representation, the amount needed at the start of their turns for it to be a win. So you have to go through a cycle of all the players on that team, making sure they all meet the requirements of the amount of influence needed in order to win that. Now for setup, it's recommended you do play at some kind of table or some kind of thing you can all sit around because it's going to be important. If you are playing teams, it's important that you space your team out accordingly because if you're all playing players, anybody can sit anywhere. But teams, when you arrange all yourselves around the table, you should go yourself, members of all the other teams that are playing, the next member of your team, same pattern, circling around. Effectively, I play my cards, members of all the other teams play their cards, then we repeat that sort of cycle until we get through all the members of every team. That you play through members of each team, members of each team, members of each team, etc., etc., so that everyone is evenly spaced out around the table. That you're not going to have that a, a team is getting behind. Each one of these, like little turns we're taking should influence one team separately until each team has had something and then it repeats it again. Now, of course, you're going to play with a deck of cards and I talked about you making a 40 card deck in the last episode. These are going to be your cards. You're going to play with them in front of you and have them in front of you the entire game. Now, you're going to want to shuffle that deck up. You want to draw a hand of 10 cards in order to start out the game. Pretty simple. I got my deck in front of me, got my 10 cards. I'm ready to play. You will determine who goes first randomly with whatever kind of situation you want to use. When we play, we play going clockwise around this table. So you're going to go around the clock each time you play. And a full rotation around the table, full rotation around the clock, is a round. So if, someone's, so if something mentions a round, that is a round. Each player takes their turn. You go a full round when everybody has taken a turn. Now, of course, the most vital card in this entire thing is your resources. We talked about what resources were last time. They generate pool. 
That's why it's so important. You put it out in front of you. There isn't a specific area you're going to put your your resources into, but regardless, more than likely, they're going to be with you the entire course of the game, and you're going to use them to influence to gain the pool you need in order to play other cards. It's representing the influence you're gaining within the communities and cultures of the island in order to gain control over it. Now, the other vital card, of course, is your characters. We did talk a little bit about characters. The most vital of all these characters are the characters which generate pool. You're going to have them within your conspiracy. I'll talk about what this means, the term conspiracy. But they're going to be there to generate pool to either allow you to play more cards or to gain the influence you need to win the game. Now, some characters can be used to attack or defend these important characters gaining your pool in order to win. Your characters are played within your conspiracy. That's the area around you in front where I talked about having three rows of things. The foremost row, which is closest to the other players, is your front line where the big attacking and damaging and blocking is being done. Your back line where your pool generators are are your behind the scenes, your hidden areas. Characters remain in your conspiracy, this zone in front of you, until they are popped, basically removed from play, which then they are put into your dead pile, i.e. your discard. It's important to understand some of these terms when we're talking about the game. Now, let's talk about character uniqueness. This is something we didn't talk about when it came to characters before. Each character is a unique character. That's as simple as that. Every one of these characters I'm going to have in my deck is unique. They have a unique name. The fact is that once I play a character with a unique name, it's the only one that can be out in play unless something specifically says in the card that this is not unique or that more than one copy of it can exist for whatever reason. Normally, this character here, only one I'm going to have in play. Its uniqueness is trumping everything. Its uniqueness is trumping everything and I can't play that unique card now. No one can play that new unique card now because it's out in play. This is an important detail to know about because that's why you really have to be careful when it comes to characters in your deck. You don't have a certain number of characters out and be unable to play anymore because uniqueness fills your hand and you can't play anything. Now the rest of your deck is going to be filled with equipment and other cards which can have an effect upon your characters or the play zone and various overall influence on it. Influence is not the word I'm really looking for here. Effect on it. But the fact is that you really could just play with a deck of resources and characters. You don't need any of those other cards. It's just that they help you out. They give enhancements that could be one-time effects or long-term repeated effects over the course of your turns that would help you and your characters to win the game for you. Now, characters and resources can be used once a turn. To represent the use of these cards, you crank them. Crank them means you turn it on its side. You go like this, you basically flip it 90 degrees to the side, and guess what then? It's cranked. It's had its effects. Now, each time at the beginning of your turn, you do uncrank everything that you had used previously, so you refresh it that you can use it again. Another thing that can occur is your cards can flip. Flip cards are count as effectively out of play for every effect except for uniqueness. A flip card is still in play when it comes to uniqueness, but for everything else, it's flipped, it's out of play, it's not an effect. You do unflip things at the beginning of your turn. Now for your early games, there is an optional rule more for beginners. It's the beginner's discard. During your discard phase, you may choose to discard one card from your hand beyond the other rules that allow you to do any kind of discarding, and then draw a replacement from it from your deck. This is made just to make you eat more easily cycle through some cards and get those cards that are really going to help you out and get rid of some of those cards which are not helpful in the circumstances at the time. Kind of make it a little bit more of an intense fight for those early on games where you're not going to be familiar with things. Let's talk about the card. All right, there's a lot of information on this card that we're going to talk about. In our upper left corner, kind of going up edgewise, is our name. Our name is, of course, unique. Now, there's also going to be titles here and lots of bits of information. These titles and bits of information can, re can attain to various cards. But it's an important thing between these two things, your name is always going to be unique. I might have two cards, same name, different kind of titles and bits of information about them. They are the same when it comes to uniqueness. 
Now, there's bits of information that are up at the top here uh, on the upper left, like a top-wise upper left corner. That can pertain to other cards, which might say it affects certain things, certain groups, certain types of cards. That is where you get a lot of this connection with other cards up. But other than that, it's just little subtitles to the name. It might mean that I have two versions of the same character at different points in time. I can only have, once again, one out at a time because of the uniqueness that still matches with these. Now, in the upper right corner, of course, is our pool cost. This is how much it is going to take us for us to, well, how much pool we have to generate in order to play this. It might have a star next to it, meaning you have to have the resources or characters in play that share some kind of characteristic with this card in order to properly play it. It means you can't just play it anyway. It might have a zero. It is important to note that if it has a zero in that corner, you can only play one zero cost card a turn. So I might have a hand of zero cost cards, but I can only get one out at a time. It does restrict me in using, a, I can't just throw out zero cost cards. Now, below our name, of course, is a box with three numbers in it. This is our power. So anything that's referring to power normally actually is referring to the top two numbers. The top number is our attack power. It's how much we can get into combat attack-wise. The number below there is our defensive power. How much we can defend when it comes to combat. And again, these two power, these two combine when something refers to power is technically referring to those. The bottom number is our pool that we can generate. This is the amount of pool that this card, when cranked, could generate, which you could use, of course, to purchase and play other cards or to generate influence. Now, sometimes your cards might have these numbers down here. It might not have these numbers at all. Characters are going to have all three. Uh, other cards might not have any on them. Or it could have ones that it mentions a plus or a minus to certain ones of these numbers, that it gives a bonus or a penalty to that's one of these things. In that case, this card is traditionally played on top of one of your characters or in association with one of your characters to grant them their appropriate bonus to, to the attack power they have, the defense power they have, or it can give bonuses or negatives to the overall pool that they can generate. All are possible effects of your gear, your conditions, your environments that they can add or subtract to different things. Now, we have our descriptive box here, which the top of it is our traits. Now, these traits here are species, gr special groups, things like that. The descriptors at top are more like types of cards and things like that that make it define that this is the unique version of this. These are the groups that are associated with it, the secret societies, if it's a special species. Below there, again, cards might influence this stuff, and this is where the more important thing is, is you might have a card that influences this group in a certain way or has an effect on this group in a certain way. That's where it comes to play. And then below there is the description of any kind of abilities that it may or may not have at the bottom below there. In the bottom right corner is where we have our collector's number, which is where it talks about what set it's from and what number within the set it is. Now we talked about the types of cards before, I'm just going to go over a little bit of extra details when we're talking about the rules for them. Of course, resources, they stay in play until they would be pocked by something. Pretty simple. Now characters, once again, they do stay in play until they're popped, but there's important things. If they generate pool, you have to crank them to do that. If you want them to attack, you have to crank them to do that. Many of them might have a special ability that you have to crank in order to activate that spe special ability. This has to be done during your turn unless it says specifically on the card, you can crank this anytime. Then, of course, you could crank this on an opponent's turn in order to get its effect or on your own turn in order to get that effect. But all of these things that you could be doing with your characters will, of course, crank them. Now, whammy cards they technically don't have a cost. So, as I said, you could play these anytime. They're almost little instants if you're comparing it to magic a little bit. But regardless, they have a cost of nothing. Not zero, which means you can... This doesn't count towards your zero cost cards. You can play any number of whammies, either on your turn, on your opponent's turn, because these are a play at any time. Gear. So gear is an interesting thing because it doesn't suffer from the same uniqueness as characters does, but it does to a degree. Every character can only have one copy of a gear on it at any time. So I may have three copies of this gear out, but I could play them on three different characters. That's fine. 
I just couldn't put all three versions of this gear on the same character. Now, gear will have its own types, things like weapons, armor, uh, tools. It will have all these subtitles. It's important to note that my character here could have any number of weapons, any number of armor, any number of these tools and other items. But when it comes to it actually getting into combat, it can use one of these weapons bonuses, one of these armor bonuses, because you have to think logically, my guy running into combat, though he owns three swords and three sets of armor, he really can only carry one sword and one set of armor into battle at any time. Basically, he gets one of these kind of things. It's, it's the logical, you know, I can only use one weapon and armor at a time, though I could own all of them. You can always choose not to use gear when it comes to combat, if it's not going to help you in any way. You could just say, no, I'm not using it. Now, it is very important to note that gear remains in play until it itself is popped, or the character that is attached to is discarded. At that time, the gear is discarded too. So if the character goes away, so does the gear. Now, conditions have the lasting effect. I did talk about them that you can have positive or negative ones. These are similar to gear that they will remain out in play as long as that character is out in play until that character is popped, then it would go away, or until it is popped, whichever happens first. So you can get rid of the condition directly or the creature it's on and then it goes away. Now environments affect everything as I said, important note about here, environments are unique. So my environmental cards, I could only have one copy out at a time of every environmental card I am playing. I can't have more than one. Again, uniqueness is an important thing to remember here. And of course, secrets deal with specific groups or secret societies within the island itself, which we did talk about the traits on the card, which mentioned the groups they're part of. Secrets are the big part of where that group to card come into play. Secrets have a significant effect on these specific groups. They give a specific special power to that group, and you can only have one copy of a secret out at any time. So again, it has a uniqueness. Very important to note. So, any card that's not in hand, or in a deck, I can check out at any time, under any player. If it's out in play in front of them, as part of their conspiracy, or their resources, or anything else they've played, if it's in their discard, I can go look again their discard to see what's there at any time. I can scope out what anybody has at any time for whatever reason. I don't actually have to have a reason. I can just look at it and be like, oh, what do you have in your graveyard? Granted, you might be a little rude if you just do that randomly. But <laughs> maybe there's some way that you can have an effect on something in that graveyard and you want to check out what's in there. Go ahead. The only other thing that you can do is you can basically play Go Fish with someone. It's if you don't really want to kind of take the time to look around, you can basically ask anybody if they have anything like that in play. Like, does anybody have any mutants? Because maybe you have an anti-mutant card and you're not playing with any mutants, but your opponents might be. You can sort of go fish and find out if anybody actually has that to get a little bit more information. Now, of course, we're going to talk about the turn you're taking. The turn you're taking, if you don't win from having enough influence... Well, it goes to go through three main phases. Each of those phases has their unique things you can do during it. Your first phase will be your card tending phase. This is where you do four main things. Uncrank, unflip, discard, draw. I'm going to go into details about all of these today, but let's talk about the other phases first. Your next one is... The next one is your operations phase. So for your operations phase, you can do any number of the following in any order. You can play your zero cost card. You can play another number of any other cards that you can generate the appropriate pool to play. So you do have to generate that pool in order to play it. You can, of course, play any number of whammies. You can play whammies anytime, so you can play them now. You could attack your opponents. It is important to note that you can attack any number of opponents, but you can only launch one attack per opponent per turn. So for each of my opponents I have, I could launch an attack against them. Granted, they only get one apiece, but I can. This does mean that on a big team game, you can get a lot of attacks in. While if it's just you versus an opponent, it's one. You can also crank any number of characters for their special abilities or to generate pool. And of course, you can crank a character to change its location within your conspiracy. Wherever row you placed it in, sometimes you want to move it around. You might want it in the front line now. You might want to move it to the behind the scenes. 
Wherever you want to move it, you would crank it, and then you'd be able to successfully move it there. Then you finally have your end of turn. End of turn, first you can shift. You can move gear around your characters. It's easy that. You can actually do that. Gear is not permanently attached. At your end of your turn, you can shift it around as appropriate to other people, other characters as needed. But it is at the end of your turn that this happens. Then, you score influence. Any amount of influence that you had before you score, get some points for it uh, that you could actually gain. Any leftover pool from characters gets influence or from anything else. That's the point in time you score it, end of the turn. Now let's dive into depths about that card tending phase a little bit more first. So of course, first is that uncranking. It's effectively changing things from its right side to face up. You're ready to use them. Pretty simple. There isn't anything really major and special about that one. They're ready for action. Unflip though, unflip you, flip it back over. Now, when it's flipped back over, it's returned to the conspiracy. It could be returned to the conspiracy where it had been, exactly where, or into a different location once you unflip it. It is important to note that an unflipped card is cranked. So for whatever reason, I had it flipped between the end of my last turn, or from my last turn to the beginning of this one. Now it's unflipped, but it is cranked, so I cannot use it this turn. It's returning to play though in the proper location. Now, for whatever reason, if a flip card cannot be come back into play, it's discarded. So if something had occurred in the meantime to make it that I could not return to play. Noting again, uniqueness did apply to this guy when I had him flipped, so I didn't have to worry about uniqueness. But there are cards which may cause some problems to this returning to play, and if so, it gets discarded. So unflipped cards can still get gone. Now, your discard phase says that I can take a look at my hand. If I have any number of cards in my hand I cannot play because of uniqueness, I can discard them and then draw the replacement. Now, this means basically, let's say, oh, I have a copy of this named character in play and this one in my hand, I don't think I'm going to be playing anytime soon. I can discard it and then draw a replacement. Of course, I'm drawing a replacement after I chose to discard any number of cards. So that basically means like these number of unique cards I can't play, I could discard all three of them. The same does apply for secrets too, because if I have a secret out in play that already matches the one I have, it's technically not suffering from the uniqueness, unlike the things like the environments and the characters, but the secrets do count the same. All the, car all the cards combined that I discard, I count them up, I draw them up. And this is only for because of uniqueness or because of secrets already out in play. If there's any other reason I can't play a card from my hand, does not count for discard. Can't use it. Finally, you draw. You draw a card. There is no limit to the number of cards I can have in my hand. My hand could be at any size. Now it is important to note that if I draw out my deck, I lose the game. Effectively, if I can't draw a card, I am out of the game. My cards remain in play until the game ends, so they have things like effects on uniqueness, environments, secrets, all that kind of stuff still has its effects, even when I'm not playing, even though I've lost. That is an important aspect of this game, that my stuff still has an influence on the game. Another important aspect is if I'm playing teams. If I'm in a team and I draw out, I'm not out of the game. As long as my team members are around, I can still play. I just don't draw cards during this phase. Effectively, if I'm on a team, I don't have to worry about drawing out my deck. But that's it for today. So we began to dive into the rules of On the Edge. We started with the basics of, you know, what the game goal is. Get enough influence, control the island. I talked about a little bit about what's on every card. Went over a little bit more information about the card types. We did talk about them very detailed last time. And then I talked about the phases of play, which I only went through one of the phases, the card tending phase today. So in the next episode, though, we're going to dive into the rest of the phases of gameplay, kind of finish them off, and hopefully finish off talking about the rules. I'm hoping to get this in two episodes. It might be three. We'll have to see. These are interesting rules, fairly simple, but fairly fun to learn. Regardless, though, I hope you're having a great day. Why don't you let me know what you think about these rules so far in the comments below? I would like to know what you think about how complex or simple these rules are in comparison to other more popular or, well, less popular card games that are out there. But until the next time, I bid you farewell.